evening, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday night at New Salem. Glad to have you with us this morning or, or this evening. You said we recognize the change of the venue. If you're here, you recognize it. If you're at home, you recognize it. Our, our praise team had a little bit of a, a scheduling issue this week as far as I looked at the practice music. So this, this might be our, our regular meeting rounds for a few weeks until we get football season over. Brother Jaden has got football practice football or fan practice and football games, so we uh, kind of come together and made up this new plan, so it will work out just fine. But it is a joy to be able to come to you tonight via our, our live stream. Hope that the blessing, uh, the God's words and blessing to you wherever you are tonight. And we certainly want to be much in prayer for the time that we spend in God's word, and I hope you take it serious uh, as I do, that we have an opportunity to read the, the greatest story ever told, and better uh, as a result. Amen. We want to go to the Lord in prayer and mention several names before us. Uh, it wasn't a prayer meeting last night. We had updates on several. Uh, Brother Bud Wood is doing, doing better. He's got surgery coming up on Friday, so we certainly pray for Brother Bud tonight. Uh, we also want to remember Miss Dolly Davis. Her, hers was when, Nancy? When was Dolly's? It was his past Monday, so we need to continue to keep Dolly in our prayer. Let me call her today. Dolly, if you're watching, we're praying for you and thinking about you tonight. Hope you're feeling good. And of course, continue to pray for uh, Sherry Colwood. She had a procedure. And the list goes on and on and on. God knows the worry. God knows the need. And we find great comfort in, in that tonight. Would you have one, maybe? You might mention uh, by way of uh, a prayer request or an update, maybe, the one we've been praying for for a while. Do you want to spoke in prayer meeting tonight? Lift up all these names to the Lord and those unspoken near and dear to your heart. We know we've all got those in our life tonight. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get into our Bible study tonight. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful, truly thankful, for the privilege to be able to gather ourselves tonight, Lord, and, and delve into your word and and, uh, and and be better for the experience. And I, I do pray, Lord, you'd bless our time together as we uh, as we seek to hear from you, as we seek to hear what your word has to say to us our hearts to be attentive, our, our ears to be alert, that we can uh, leave tonight with one of those aha kind of moments uh, from our, our time spent in your word. I thank you for those that have gathered with us tonight here in person. We thank you for those that are watching at home, and I pray God your blessings on each other. Lord, I know they've got worries and concerns and cares in their life that, that only you can fix, that only you're able to, to satisfy. And I pray God that you'll speak into those circumstances that you'll speak into the, the medical needs and the emotional worries and uh, the physical needs Lord we know of some that, that have, a, have a truly uh, a physical tangible need I pray God you fulfill that beyond our expectation I ask you Lord you bless those that uh, heart goes out to that are battling medical needs some that are recovering some that are facing procedures I pray oh God that you'll strengthen them Give them a peace, a uh, night's nice rest before the procedure. And those that are home recovering, that they have a quicker recovery, Lord, they can be back up doing those things that they so love to do. I do pray a blessing tonight on all of our teachers. Lord, I know they're overwhelmed and, and, and feeling uh, truly uh, up against the wall at times. And I pray God for all of them. I'm going to try to mention them because I'll forget somebody. You know those that's crossing my mind's eye even as I pray. That you'll give them just exactly what they stand in need of patience and, and strength and endurance for this battle that's in my face it every day. I pray a continued blessing on our, our nation, on our president, our church leadership, Lord, our local pastors and, and other agencies that God is going to strive to, to be all that you've called us to be uh, in this uh, sketchy kind of day and time that we're living. <coughs> Use us for your glory. Help us to be faithful in all that we say, all that we do. Bless and praise me as we get ready for Sunday. I pray God you bless their time together in rehearsal and meet with us on Sunday uh, with the mighty show and your spirit. And I'm glad to praise you for it all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Amen. Well, we come tonight to the last passage in our study through Colossians. We may finish it, we may not. Well, there's about 16 verses left from chapter from verse number 2 down through verse number 17. And we'll see how far we get into that tonight as the Lord would be our guide and our helper. But we 
we've uh, we've entitled this whole series, if you remember, we called it you know, uh, "Complete in Christ." And I I borrowed that title from what Paul said in chapter two, verse number ten, that in Him you have been made complete. And I love that promise. I love the fact that He's given us all that we need. And He writes in another place everything necessary for for godliness. He's instilled that in us through the dwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. So we praise Him uh, for that. We, we glory in the fact that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And because of that, he's got it all covered. He's got all the bases covered. As our Savior, he's got our salvation covered. As our Creator, he knows us. He's got our life covered. And as God himself, he's got everything else covered. So we rest in that. So far in this study through Colossians, we've explored the idea that what we have before us in the pages of God's word is the full and final revelation of God. We, we've spoken much about how that we need to be growing in our understanding of the word. Uh, we've got to be careful not to be fooled by, by a lot of the false prophets, a lot of the voices that's coming at us from every direction this day and time. And I stated early in this study that the first couple of chapters in this book, it's almost as if Paul was saying, okay, here's what you need to know now that you're complete in Christ. He kind of lays it out. Be blessed by it. Be encouraged by it. Here's what you need to know, what Christ has done for you. But then he kicks off chapter number three and into chapter number four. It's like he begin to say, now that you know that, now that you've uh, embraced the fact that we are being made complete in Christ, here's what you need to do with it. Here's what you need to be doing with, with that that I've taught. And uh, he, he's given us several uh, words of instruction on how our Christian life ought to be shaping up. There was one place there in chapter 3, I think it's maybe verses, yeah, verses 8 through 10. Uh, there, he, there he's basically telling us that, uh, that now that we're completing Christ, we, we've got to let go of some things. We've got to let go of some of our fleshly tendencies and our, and our fleshly uh, inclinations at times. But he goes on to tell us once we let go of the anger and the rage and the lies and the immorality, all that stuff that he outlines for us, then he gives us the flip side. He says, here's what you need to put on you need to put on compassion and gentleness and humility and forgiveness. And he says that when we do, that there will be a noticeable difference in our lives. And what he basically does in chapter 3 and 4 is to outline four key areas in our lives where this difference should be seen. A noticeable difference, he says. We've looked at our church life. We've looked at our home life. Last time we even looked at our, at our work life, how we interact with our boss and our co-workers. But now tonight, we look at the fourth and final one as we bring this study to a close. There should be a noticeable difference in our speech pattern, how we use our gift of speech. And we begin, it, yeah, that's, this passage begins in chapter two, and, or chapter four, verse number two, and rolls right down to the tail end of this chapter. And now, let me, let me tell you this. This is no secret to anybody, but it is no secret that folks love to talk. Uh, I read somewhere a, a, a scientific kind of a study, and I can't, I can't confirm it. And don't shoot the messenger. I'll just tell you what I read. I read that the average American has about 30 conversations a day, that you'll spend about a fifth, one-fifth of your life talking. And in one year, Somebody said, I, I should have wrote down the source. I guess I should have cited my source. But they said that your conversations, by the time in one year, you'll have enough conversations to fill 66 books, about 800 pages each. If you recorded every piece of every conversation that you had in a given year. But here, here's, the, here's the worrisome part. I'm going to share it with you because I didn't write it. I'm just, I'm just reading what I read. The average American man speaks about 20,000 words a day. The average American woman, about 30,000 words a day. So that proves right there that we're just trying to get a word in every time we have, just every word we can. We're just trying to get a word in any time we have that opportunity. But uh, we, we, there's, a, there's a whole lot of scripture that talks about our mouth, our tongue. I, I want to do this for you. I, I want you to, just kind of a way of introduction, I want you to turn to James chapter 3. What I want to do, I, I found a pretty, I'm not a big, typically a big fan of paraphrases. Of God's word, but this was not bad. And I want to I want you to follow along as I kind of paraphrase for you James chapter 3, probably the most familiar passage of 
about the tongue and the power that the tongue can have. Uh, and, and, I, and I want you to follow along because everybody's going to have a different translation probably tonight, or not everybody, but there's more than one translation in the room. But I want you to follow along, chapter 3, verse number 3, and watch what they, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase, you kind of follow along in your Bible. We can make a large horse turn around and go wherever we want by means of a small bit in his mouth. And a tiny rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot wants it to go, even though the winds are strong. So also, the tongue is a small thing, but what enormous damage it can do. A tiny spark set a great forest on fire, and the tongue is a flame of fire. It's full of wickedness that can ruin your whole life. It can turn the entire course of your life into a blazing flame of destruction, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, and reptiles, and fish, but nobody can tame the tongue. It's an uncontrollable evil full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it breaks out into curses against those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessings and cursings come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Can you pick olives from a fig tree or figs from a grapevine? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salt pool. So again, a very familiar text has been, it's been sliced and diced in every kind of way. Uh, preachers and teachers have talked about the power of, of the tongue, and, and we've said it time and time again. Uh, it's not enough that we as Christians simply take off the bad. It's, it's not just enough for us to... to to not do the don'ts. We've got to put on the good. We've got to start doing the do, as the Bible might say. So the application here is very, very clear. We replace our bad fleshly behavior with good spirit-led behavior. And again, if you've been in church long as I have, you know that preachers often preach on the wrong use of the tongue. We hear it all the time and the damage it can do. James just talked about that. But that's really not our, our focus tonight. James does a, a good job of summing that up for us. But I will pull from what James said when he says that the tongue can and is oftentimes used for bad, but it was designed by God to be used for good. And just as surely as it's powerful in its destruction, it can be just as powerful when it's used for good. And that's what we'll see in Colossians chapter 4 tonight. The tongue isn't all bad. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18 says, Reckless words uh, pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 16, 24, pleasant words are honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. So there, there is a good thing that the tongue can do. And what we're going to find out in this final passage, our final push to the end of Colossians, are some of the things that our tongue can do for good. And first of all, first and foremost, we can use our tongue in prayer. Notice verse number 2. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been in prison, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. I think we can say without hesitation that the greatest Use of this gift of speech is the opportunity to pray. And if, if the Apostle Paul felt the need to spend time in prayer, so should we. What Paul does for us is, is describe for us the characteristics of satisfying and spiritual prayer life and what it should look like. First of all, straight out of the box, verse number two. He says that we need to pray faithfully. Pray faithfully. I see that in the phrase, devote yourselves to prayer. I think it's no, it's no uh, coincidence that Paul uses the word devote because all of us are devoted to something. We know what it means to be devoted to something. If you talk about somebody being a, a devoted mom, then we know that, that mom spends time and effort uh, with her family everything necessary for her family. If I said he was a real devoted company man, you know what that means. He, he spends most of his time on his career doing all that the company needs him to do. Being devoted to something, it simply means that I've got a strong desire 
to see something happen in my life and with my life. Let me tell you something about desire. The funny thing about desire is you can't fake it. There's no substitute for desire. Because without it, you won't even get out of the starting game. What you'll realize long before your hopes are ever fulfilled, you'll quit. Long before your dreams are ever realized, you'll quit. The best example I can give you is when I was in the Navy, there was there was two times, two examples in my life that come to my mind. One was was the, the, the was the was the physical readiness testing, the running and all that kind of stuff. I was never devoted to that. I did it because I had to. I did it because they, they, they knew they were going to test us twice a year. But as far as me just doing it on my own and knowing it was good for me, I, it, it didn't take much excuse. If it was raining a little bit or this hurt or I woke up and it's too, it didn't take me hard anything to talk myself out of it. I can also remember that at a time as, as, a, uh, as a meteorologist for the Navy, there was this one particular forecasting course that we had to, to complete. And, and, and they, they, they pushed it and pushed it and pushed it, and I kept putting it off, putting it off, and putting it off, because I wasn't devoted to that. The, the Navy was just a way to pay the bills, because the Navy was just my job, and my, my the dedication was to my family and to my church. And, and but, but finally, once I got to the point that it was something I felt that I wanted to do, my point simply is that once, once we recognize that I've devoted myself to that, then it comes easy. I think what Paul would want us to say, want us to know when he says devote yourselves to prayer, he's saying that that Christian that is devoted to praying will have a strong desire to spend time in prayer, will have a desire to, to expend the effort to pray. That will be the person that, that prays more than just on Sunday, and prays more than just over their meals, or prays more when there's just a, a crisis in their life. They'll, they'll pray even when they don't want anything from God. That's the kind of devoted prayer that Paul is calling us to. And if you read anything in Scripture at all, what you're going to find out is the Bible is teeming with passages over and over and over that teaches us that we serve an almighty, all-powerful God that is listening and is ready, willing, and prays His name more than able to, the, to answer the prayers of his people. You, you see it in the stories of Israel's exodus. They, they, uh, the Bible says that he heard the cries of his people from down in the Egyptian bondage. Uh, from, so from their exodus from, from Egypt all the way through to the journey to the promised land, God heard the cries, heard the prayers of the people, and he answered it. Fast forward to the New Testament. When Jesus himself calls out to God the Father, he stilled the storms. He provided food. He healed the sick. He raised the dead because he prayed to the Father. And then move forward even further. When the early church began to grow and saw that explosion in growth and began to spread throughout the known world, God answered the prayers of the, of the, of the believers, continually praying for power and for direction and for healing and for deliverance. I had on a sign once before, and I may put on the sign again this week, but I love the line. It's not original to me. I love the line that says, when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. And I've always loved that line. The supernatural power of God is available to folks like us. Those of us that are convicted to the core of our being that he can and he wants to make a difference in our lives. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer. We need to pray faithfully. But also, our prayer needs to be watched watchful. I see that also in verse number 2. He says, keeping alert in it. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it. it means we've got to be awake. We've got to be alert as we're praying. The phrase, watch and pray, was, was uh, used by Jesus on more than one occasion. But it was also used within the Old Testament. There's a, there's a place in Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah is rebuilding the walls and the gates around Jerusalem. Y'all remember that account? And the enemies were purposely trying to stop them from working. Remember that? They would go to work with a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other hand. And Nehemiah chapter 4, verse number 9, says that they prayed to God and they also kept watching. They prayed and they kept watching for the enemy. They kept their eyes always on alert to see what it is the enemies were doing. Jesus used that phrase in the garden the night of his arrest. He told his disciples to sit right there and watch and pray. But what does Paul mean? What's Paul mean when he 
he tells us to keep alert. In it. How, how, does, how does that fit our prayer life? What does Paul's command mean to us today? What, what are we being commanded to be watchful or alert for? Well, I think like Nehemiah, we need to be alert for the enemy. We need to be recognizing what the enemy's up to. Satan don't want us to build a relationship with God. He doesn't want us to be praying and, and speaking and let God speak to us. We need to be alert to what the enemy's up to. We also need to be alert to our own weakness, our own vulnerability. We need to be alert to our own uh, temptation so that we don't fall asleep in the garden like the disciples did on Jesus. But I believe I can stretch it one bit further and say that we need to be alert to the brothers and sisters around us. We need to be alert to what it is that they are going through, their needs and their hurts and their pain, so that we can lift them up in prayer, keeping alert. That's watchful. So, so we need to pray faithfully. We need to pray watchfully. But the second one is right there pretty clear. You devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Those that have been coming on a Friday night or a Tuesday night prayer meetings know that, that uh, that's, that's one of the little acronyms that we, we follow, little acronym acts. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then supplication. Thanksgiving has to be a big part of our prayer life. Because Jesus taught the disciples, when you pray, he says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then part of that was, was adoration and lifting up the name of Jesus. But part of that is also thanksgiving. Thanksgiving has to be an essential part of our praying. We ought to be thankful. My goodness, Lord, be thankful that I can come out right into the throne room of Almighty God, the one true, almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, King of kings and Lord of lords, hears me when I pray. If, if he didn't bless me at all, if he didn't provide for my family, if he didn't make me healthy and able to work, if he didn't provide none of that, the fact that he hears me when I pray, that ought to be enough to make us thankful. We ought to be thankful, as the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8, giving all my worries and all my cares to God, who cares about what happens to us. So we pray thankfully to him because we know he has the power to deliver. He's got the promise that he's going to work all things for our good. Remember that passage we looked at a couple weeks ago? Praying thankfully ought to come easy because he's answered prayers before. Amen. Mm -hmm. we, we've seen him be good to us in the past. So we ought to make thankful praying awful easy. So we need to pray faithfully. We need to pray watchfully. We need to pray thankfully. But watch this though. I think you also need to pray with purpose. Pray with purpose. I think that's another characteristic of a, of a powerful prayer life. James chapter 5, verse number 16 says great things happen when believing people pray. I think it actually says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We have the ability to pray with great power, and that's only given to us because we've been given access to God in prayer. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 tells us that I can come boldly into his presence. Isn't that, isn't that a blessing? Isn't that a blessing that I can come into the, I can come boldly into the presence of God that loves me and I can receive mercy, I can find grace when I need it most. But yet, here's the way we pray. And it's usually pretty vague, pretty general. And I know we've all been guilty of it, praying prayers like, Lord, Bless our church and bless our missionaries. Bless the pastor. Bless our military. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think what it's an example. Watch this. Watch that. Watch how specific Paul was when he prayed. Watch this. Verse number three. After he said, "Devote yourself to prayer, keep in alert with thanksgiving." He says, "Praying at the same time." He said, "For us that God will open to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ." for which I've also been in prison. Paul is basically saying, don't, don't pray, God bless Paul. That's, that's a great prayer. Nothing wrong with that prayer. But Paul says, let me make it easy for you. Let me make it easy to pray. Would y'all just pray that God will open up opportunities, open up doors, so that we can preach Jesus. So we can preach the mystery of Christ. By the way, he says the same message I'm in prison for right now. We need to have another opportunity to preach the same message that threw me in prison. We need to be preaching more about that. So praying with purpose. That means that my prayers are not random. My prayers are not vague. They're not just directionless requests. They're laser-focused prayers of intercession. A 
about what's important to those that we love, what's important to the leadership at our church. And we strive every week to give you very specific things to pray for. And I hope that that, that, that kind of settled things in your mind. How to be praying. That I might make it clear, he says in verse 4, in the way I ought to speak. Very specific. So without a doubt, the, the best, one of the best things we can do with this old tongue of ours is to pray. He moves on in verse 5 and says the next thing we can do with our tongue is proclaim Jesus. Tell our friends, tell us, our, our cousins and our brothers and sisters and our neighbors about who Jesus is. Look at verse 5. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Now, I can only challenge you so far tonight. I'm going to challenge you with this and say, there's, can, can you think of any better use of the ability that we have to talk than to tell people about Jesus? To tell folks that they matter to God. To tell folks that they're, that they're special. That they're special enough to God that he sent his only son to die for them. That they're special enough that Jesus loves them, has a plan for their life, and has prepared an awesome place for them in heaven. What greater way can we use this vulnerability in this world of ours than to say, hey, you know, God loves you so much that he gave his only son. And whosoever would believe on him should not perish. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn it. He sent his son into the world to, to save it. And there's no judgment awaiting those that trust him. And those that, that don't trust him have already been judged for not believing the only son of God. That's John 3, 16 through 18. Very loose paraphrase, but that's the way you can share that glorious truth. And Paul says in the latter part of verse number 5, he says make the, make the most of every opportunity. If I'm sharing lunch with somebody, if I'm stuck in the car with somebody, waiting at the doctor's office with somebody, you know, there's going to be opportunity. And Paul says don't miss them. Don't miss those opportunities. When I have an opportunity to talk to somebody about hunting or fishing, if I've got an opportunity to talk to somebody about anything else in life, about my kids, my grandkids, my ailments, my worry, whatever, I'm, we, we make plenty of time for small talk. But he says, don't miss an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. And Paul says to do that, when we encounter opportunities to share Jesus, to make the best of every one of those opportunities, Paul tells us two things. He says, in order for us to make the most out of every those situations, there's two things that we've got to be doing. He says, first of all, we've got to watch out the way we're walking. We gotta watch our walk. Conduct yourself, he says. You know, as far as most outsiders are concerned, you go to talk to folks that didn't grow up in the church the way you did. Folks that don't have a relationship with the, with the Lord and Savior like that you do. Uh, you need to realize that it's, you, you're going to almost be speaking another language to them. We, we, we sometimes we throw around this terminology and, and sometimes don't even don't even really mean to, but it's just this 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 speak that we have. But you know, that's not original to us. You know, the earliest Christians during Paul's time, the people that he's writing to at Colossae and Thessalonica and Ephesus and all those what we call the Pauline epistles, Christians in Paul's day already had several strikes against them just like we do. You know that in societal circles during the early days of the church, Christians were often viewed as atheists because they didn't worship any kind of a visible God. They didn't worship the statues. They didn't worship the, the, the Zeus's and the, the Athenas and all the, the, the cool gods that everybody else worshiped. They're worshiping an invisible God. So they were they were classified as atheists quite often because they weren't worshiping a God that we didn't know anything about. They were oftentimes considered pretty unpatriotic because they wouldn't burn incense to the emperor. They 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 they, they pushed back against the Roman tyranny. They were oftentimes even considered immoral because they met behind closed doors. And the word got out about the, about the sacrifice of Jesus and, and the communion. And Jesus said, this is my body. Eat this and drink this. Word began to spread. And during their, who knows what they're doing. They, they'd go behind these closed doors and, and, and they were doing it for their own safety. But the word began to spread. So Paul was talking to believers here and he warns them 
don't do stuff that will perpetuate those attitudes. They already think we're atheists. They already think we're unpatriotic, immoral, who knows what. He says, conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. He says, avoid doing stuff that would hinder the sharing of the gospel. And he says, do it with wisdom. Those, those that need to hear about Jesus the most are the ones that's going to watch us as Christians and be the most critical. Those, those that have grown up with, with some kind of a, 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 a very brief kind of a passing knowledge of Christianity. Went to Bible school as a kid. My grandma taught Bible school. My grandma was in Sunday school. I went to the church. They've got, they've got this much Christianity here, this much church, this much church experience. They might be a little bit easier on you, but the, those, those that have zero point of reference are looking the closest at us. There must be nothing in our lives that will jeopardize our testimony. Much like these Christians that we talked about in Paul's day, as far as the world goes, we already have strikes against us too. They, they think the church is boring. They think our music is out of date. They think the message is stale and irrelevant. That, that everybody who goes to church are, are, are uptight and unfriendly and all they talk about is wanting your money and and all, all of that, that when people drop in though for our services, when they when they drop in, I'm gonna just say you say, when they drop into any of our sister churches, and I've been to many of them, and I know those pastors have the same heart that I do. We want them to discover that church is not what they think it is. We want them to understand that church is, is an atmosphere where it can be uplifting, where the messages that the preacher brings, we strive to be as, as relevant as we can and the people are, are friendly and it's a place that you can come and, and let your hair down and, and, and be at ease among folks that love you. I, I, I want people that need Jesus to feel comfortable around Jesus' foes. But that's not always going to be the case. Because, it, because again, they went when they were kids, they were drugged to church as a kid, they had a bad experience with this, a bad experience with that. But I want them to know that it's more about than wearing certain clothes and, and, and speaking a certain kind of language or being in some kind of, it's not a secret ritual that we're part of. And we're nothing but a, but, a, but a bunch of imperfect people that have been saved by the glorious grace and mercy of a loving Heavenly Father. We just like hanging out together. Mm -hmm. We love praising the Lord and studying His Word and, and just trying to be more like Him. And trying to make a difference in our, in our world around us. That's the walk. That's just the walk. But then there comes a time when our walk has to become our talk. Conduct yourselves, he says, verse 5, with wisdom towards the outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. But then he comes back again to the tongue part. Here's, here's where we get the second part of the, the, the tongue. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you'll know how you should respond to each person. Now, there's two passages, places, I put it in the word. I combine places and passages. I come up with places. There's two papers. <laughs> There's two places in Colossians that kind of speaks to this. Colossians 3.17, Paul has already said, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. He says in Colossians chapter 4, verse number 6 now, let your speech always be with grace. So there's a direct connection between these two verses. In order to speak in the name of Jesus, grace has to be in our hearts. We have to have a taste. Have to be, it has to be seasoned. Let me say that. Let your grace, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. Let me tell you something. Nobody that, that curses or swears or lies and gossips and runs other people down on a regular basis, those folks are not speaking from a grace-filled heart. That, that heart has not been seasoned as if salt with the grace of God. This, this is going to crawl right before you live. But I'm going to say it anyway. I think with a grace-filled heart, 
You'll have a hard time yelling at other drivers. You'll have a hard time screaming at the kids even though they, you know, they deserve it. I'm not talking about corrects. I'm talking about just screaming because you're just mad. I'm, I'm talking about saying unkind things. Yeah, I just don't know that you can do those things and do them in Jesus' name. That's always, that's always the, the, the mark. Can I do that and do it in the name of Jesus? We've threatened them. Like you said, before we came in the name of Jesus, I'm going to, I'm going to chat. I'm going to knock the devil out of you in the name of Jesus. That, that's about Joe Barker said that. But, uh, but we're being completely cynical. But the, but the idea being that if my speech is always with grace, even though it comes out before we can stop it, immediately you regret it. I'm not going to tell you who, because I wouldn't embarrass him or anything in this world. But we had one of our own that calls New Salem home, talking about this whole thing with all the kids at home, trying to do, you know, the, the computer stuff. And she said, I'm going to tell you, preacher, sometimes I say bad words. <laughs> sometimes. And I, and I think the difference is, just like any other moment in our life when we've said or did something that we know is unpleasing to the Lord, I think if it's seasoned with grace, as though seasoned with salt, there'll be that chastising hand of the Holy Spirit of God says, you know, that's not really what it ought to be called. Let me, let me give you four real quick. Oh, yeah, one good chance. Let me give you real quick four simple tests of grace-filled speech. How, how you can recognize if your speech is, is grace and they're very, 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 very short. Number one, is it true? Is it true? If he says it's that it be as though seasoned with salt, you know what salt is for. Salt was for preserving. Salt is, is for purifying. So seasoned speech is truthful speech. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 tells us to speak the truth in love. Before you repeat anything, make sure it's True. Somebody said one time, I, I believe half of what I see and nothing of what I hear. Amen. And now with it in the day of, of the internet, you guess we keep believing nothing that you see anymore. Believe half, about half of what you see with your own eyes, but even that can be manipulated this day and time. I'm tell you something, just because they said it on the internet, just because they said it on television, just because somebody in your circle of friends tells you something, doesn't mean it's true. So don't be repeating it. You don't know with complete confidence that it's true. Number one, is it true? Number two, is it complete? What they said might be true, but it may not be complete. So make sure you know the whole story before you start repeating something. Make sure you can, can, you can uh, trust your source. Is it true? Is it complete? And thirdly, is it necessary? It may be true, and it may be complete, but is it necessary to repeat it? Again, speak the truth in love. Some of the most hurtful words I've ever heard have been preceded by the words, you know, to tell you the truth, I, used to, I, I, I laughed at that phrase because it makes me think, you mean you weren't telling me the truth before? <laughs> if I start with, you know, to be perfectly honest, well, that means you wasn't honest before. So I've, I've stopped trying to say that. But to say, you know, to tell you the truth, she likes to drink a little. Or, or to tell you the truth, he's, he's, he's not always whole. I, you, 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 just because it's the truth doesn't mean it's necessary. There is a time truly when silence is golden, is it necessary? Is it true? Is it complete? Is it necessary? And fourthly, very simply, is it kind? Is it kind? You know, Romans chapter 12, verse number 10 says, Be kindly affectioned to one another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, evil speaking, put away from you with all malice. I think there's something to be said. I, it's, not, it's not worded specifically like that in Scripture, but I believe there's something to be said. You, you can piece a lot of those verses together and come up with the old adage, if you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. And 
I don't think you can see that. Again, not, not verbatim like that, but the truth is there. Kindly, Romans 12, 10. Be kindly affection one with another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. You can't say something nice. Don't say nothing at all. So here's, here's the suggestions. That was just kind of a little test for you, for, for you to run those four little questions by. Every time you get ready to say something, ask yourself those four questions. Is it true? Is it complete? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Here's the, here's the takeaway from this section number two. Here's the suggestions for speaking with grace. It's obviously we've been told to let your speech always be with grace. There's no way to spin that. It is what it says, what it, there's no way around. And I dare say the King James probably doesn't say it much different than that. Let your speech always be with grace. So that means that there's a couple things I'm going to do. There's a couple of suggestions that I've got to make to you tonight. One, determine to control your tongue. Just, just, just determine it that I, I'm going to do better. Lord, with your help, I'm going, to do, I'm going to determine to let everything that I say be seasoned with grace. Number two, I'm only going to say good things about other folks. I'm only going to say good things. Number three, remember who you're accountable to. Remember Matthew 12, 36. You know Matthew 12, 36? Jesus himself speaking says, Every idle word that you speak, you'll give an account for it. That'll, that'll hold your feet to the fire real quick. So remember who you're accountable to. And then lastly, and I probably should have put them around me this one, the first one, ask the Lord to help. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 141, verse 3. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. That's a, that's a, that's a great prayer all of us at times in our life should have been praying. So our tongue can be used for good things. First, we saw that it, 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 it could be it's for praying. Secondly, it's it's for the glorious truth of just telling folks about Jesus. And the third way we can use our tongue is praising our fellow Christians. I love this passage. I love this part about the life of Paul. He tells us in, in many places, and Jesus does too. Paul kind of just reiterates it, but we're told throughout scriptures not to tear each other down. But to work hard on building each other up with their tongues. And one of the best ways to build them up is to praise them and to speak well of them. And there's, there's a parenting application right here. Nothing is, nothing is as good for your children as for, you, as for them to hear you bragging about them to somebody else. Whether it's a banjo picking video that's been on Facebook and talk about how proud you are of the kid. Or they're at, at, at open house at the school and, and you say, you know, you know, brag, brag, brag. There's nothing that will do better for, for their sense of, of, of who they are. One of the best ways is to brag about people. And the Apostle Paul puts that into action. In the last part of this chapter from verses 7 down through verse number 18, Paul praises people. Scroll through there and notice verse number seven that you'll see the word Tychius. He calls him a dear brother. He calls him a faithful minister and a fellow servant. How thankful he is. And, and he says that you trust Tychius. He said he's going to bring you some information. I'll send him to you for this very purpose that you may know about my circumstances, that he may be, that he may encourage your hearts. He's in essence saying, y'all going to like Tychius. He, he's just a cool cat. He's got some good information. He's got some good news for you. He's been faithful, and uh, you, you receive him. He'll be an encouragement to you. And then there's Onesimus. Anybody remember that name? Does that name ring a bell with anybody? Where's that name come from, Lisa? Um, the, the, he ran away from his master. Yeah. Or the other people. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but he was, it's Philemon. That's, that's, yes. that's the whole story behind the, the epistle of Philemon. And he not notice what he calls him now. He's faithful. He's a beloved brother. He's one of you, he said. Who's one of your number? He said, they'll inform you about the whole situation here. So he brags about Onesimus. He's, he calls him a fellow slave. He used to be a slave, like I said. Now he's a faithful, dear brother. And then there's then there's Aristarchus, uh, my fellow prisoner. He sends you greetings. There's Barnabas' cousin Mark, about whom you receive instructions if he comes to you, welcome him. And also Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision. They have proved to be an encouragement to me. Fellow workers in the kingdom of God 
comforter, Paul says. These boys have been important to me. And then there's, then there's Epaphras. He said, he's also one of you. He's also a good Jewish boy like you all, like y'all are. A bond slave of Jesus Christ. He sends you greetings. He's like, he, look what, he, he, it's almost like he says, oh, if he's on the phone, they'd be like, hey, Epaphras says, hey. That's what he says. He says he's one of it. He sends his, sends greetings. And watch how he brags about it. Laboring earnestly for you in his prayers that you may stand perfectly and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. And he goes on and says, then there's Luke, the beloved physician. Luke was always right there with Paul. He said, he sends you greetings. And then there's Demas. Greet the brethren, he says, in, 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 her, in the Laodicea and also in the, in the church. That is, so, so this whole long list is just an example where Paul is always doing that. Paul was always seeking opportunities to brag on folks. He closes a lot of his epistles that way. If, if somebody's with him, he'll brag on them and send a word back to whoever he's writing. And he spoke a good word about his brothers and his sisters in the Lord. Those that was working alongside of him in his struggle for the kingdom of God and all things he was trying to do. He just looked for ways to praise people publicly. And I think that's a great lesson for all of us. If you, if you if just, just brag on somebody, if somebody goes out of their way to help you, tell somebody. We find it awful easy to talk bad, don't we? If they've got, if they've got, a, if they've got a little bit of a, a problem in their life, we'll share a prayer request. You know, just pray for pray so and so. That's all, as you know, da 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 da. When's the last time you went out of your way to say, Can I tell you what old so and so did to me or did for me? He went, he went and picked me up when I was broke down by the side of the road. I mean, they broke out his lawn chair and sat there beside me waiting on the record to come. You know, those, those kind of things. That's what Paul would tell us to do. He would look for opportunities to brag on folks, to encourage one. It's a glorious way to use that little thing that dangles between our teeth. Because it might just get contagious. You might just see it break out and other people pick up on it. So we can use our tongue in prayer. We can use our tongue in proclaiming Jesus to the world. And we can use this old tongue to brag on fellow Christians. Notice the last part of verse 16 following. He continues that same thought. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. We live in a world very similar to who Paul was writing to. And as I said early on in this study, during the introduction, I think I probably mentioned it again, that we live in a world today where a lot of people and a lot of groups are not necessarily against Jesus but a lot of folks will tell you that they don't know that Jesus is necessarily enough. Those young Colossian Christians were, to, were being told by those false teachers that they needed Jesus plus something else. You need Jesus plus the right ritual. You need Jesus plus a little bit of pagan astrology mixed in. You need Jesus plus a little bit of your own efforts. But I'll leave you tonight, and we'll close up this study by going back to what I felt was kind of the high water mark, the, the, the pivot point of this whole book. Notice we begin, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. I remind you again, the word to the Colossian believers is a word to us today, wherever you find yourself. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. He is the head over all rule and authority. So remember that, dear friend. If you're a born again, spirit filled child of God, you have been made complete in Christ Jesus. In Him, you have been made complete. Amen. Father, I praise you for this great study. Lord, I thank you for all that you've showed me, that you open my eyes to and then reveal new things and, and new uh, a deeper understanding of who Paul was writing to and why he was writing. I pray God you guide me as I look to, for the next direction as we look for the next focus of study. Would you please uh, grant me wisdom and understanding and insight 
as to what it is that your people are desperate to hear. God is going to lead us through the rest of this week as we turn our hearts towards Sunday. I pray to prepare our hearts for worship even now. God is to lead us. Help us to be faithful the way we use our tongue. Use it for your glory in every way. And I praise you for it. In Jesus' precious name.